a bit nerve-wracking for me being here. Um, when I walk back to Salford, when I come back to Salford, I still feel like a student again. Uh, and seeing some of my previous supervisors sitting in the audience is particularly, uh, particularly frightening. But the other reason I'm particularly concerned about tonight is that talking about energy at Salford is a little bit like taking coals to Newcastle. So uh, I hope not too many people are going to pick up on what I, uh, what I say and criticise it. Um, that's the title of my talk. Um, I am from the University of Huddersfield, but I'm also representing an organisation called Thoria. Thoria is the Thorium Energy Amplifier Association. It has a website. Anybody who wants to join, it's free, and we have some very interesting meetings and lectures. And you can find out more about what I'm going to talk about um, through Thoria, through the website, and also through the, through the meetings. I think the thing that characterises the present is that we seem to be living in an era of crises. We have the banking crisis, we have the terrorist crisis, uh, we have the food crisis that I was listening to, uh, listening about on, on Radio 4 this, this morning. Uh, we have global warming. But to my mind, one of the most significant crises we face is the, is the global energy crisis. Um, I think the planet, and indeed civilization itself, is starting to run out of energy at, at a great rate of knots. And one way of thinking about this is that in the year 2000, the world population was 6 billion. And the total energy consumption per year was about uh, 10 billion tows, or tons of oil equivalent. So the per person consumption is about 1.6 tons of oil equivalent per year. And the electricity component of that is about 0.5 tons of oil uh, equivalent. Now in 2050, the world population is expected to reach 9 billion. So that's a population growth of 165,000 per day across the world. Now, if each one of those new members of the human race uses as much energy as we're using at the moment, then that really is the source of the crisis. Because assuming current electricity usage per capita, the additional requirement is equivalent to 1,000 megawatts of electricity, or a gigawatt, per day. And what that means is that essentially we have to build one of these things every single day for the next 50 years simply to keep up with electricity consumption. Now, bearing in mind that most of the other sources uh, of energy are extremely dirty in terms of the, the, the environment, um, and we're relying too heavily on oil, and we're relying too heavily on gas, uh, we really should be looking at cutting in to the other energy use we have and replacing that with, with electricity. So one third of our energy consumption is in electricity, two thirds of it is in fossil fuels, oil, coal and gas. And what we really want to do is not just provide the electricity we need at the rate of one of these per day, what we also need to do is build a greater capacity so we can start eating into these other uh, energy uses and replacing them with clean electricity. So, of course, I've already mentioned that we've got the global warming problem, and this comes down really to the, to the carbon problem. And we're pretty much in meltdown when you think about the energy sources that we're using at the moment. Most of our electricity, and in fact most of our energy usage, comes from these sources here. So if we take coal, for example, we're producing approximately a kilogram of carbon into the atmosphere for every kilowatt hour of electricity. And as we look down the list, we can see that you know, gas is a little bit cleaner, but of course that's, that's a limited resource. Geothermal, energy crops, hydroelectric, although these have been sold as clean energy sources, they're not that clean. Wind comes in at about, about 8 grams of carbon per kilowatt, and right at the top of the list is nuclear. So if we are wanting to address both the energy crisis and the carbon problem, what we really must do is turn to nuclear. Now, I've never been particularly an advocate of nuclear, but um, these are not my figures. These are produced by the Government Energy Support Unit, and they have been confirmed independently by uh, the OECD. So to provide that extra gigawatt power station every single day, we shouldn't be building coal, oil, diesel, gas power stations. What we should be doing is probably looking towards nuclear. Do we really need it in the UK? Well, we hear a lot about wind power, we hear a lot about wave power, tidal power, and so on. But 
when you look at the figures realistically, and for example, Mackay's book on, on energy will, will confirm most of this, the maximum that we can probably produce from these alternative energy sources is going to be about 35% of our total needs at the moment. That's about 40 gigawatts. But of course, the other thing that you have to remember is that we don't have much sun in the UK, so we need a backup for this. We don't, can't always rely on wind. If the wind stops in the middle of the World Cup final, everybody will complain. So we need a backup for wind. And these technologies are not yet sufficiently developed to be fully, fully deployed. So what we're saying is that 35% maximum of the electricity we use at the moment could be delivered by these alternative forms of energy. But then what about the remaining 60, uh, 65%? And remember also that this is only 35% of a third of our energy usage. So it's 10% in total. So we really do need to move up to the next stage and have a much more reliable and more importantly clean form of energy. If we look towards nuclear, let's just have a look at how the world is deploying nuclear energy at the moment. Well, you can see that on average, something like 16% of the world's electricity is produced by nuclear. If you look at the individual countries, you actually see quite a different story. If we take, for example, the United Kingdom, 22% of our electricity is produced by nuclear. But by 2020, all but one of our nuclear power stations will have closed. And so the nuclear power stations that the Labour government uh, um, authorised just before the, the election will be coming online at about that time. So it's going to be very difficult for us to even maintain this 22% production from nuclear, let alone increase the amount of energy electricity that we would produce from nuclear. If you take France, on the other hand, they're producing 78% of their electricity with nuclear. And whether you like nuclear or not, if we're running short of electricity in this country, we're going to buy it from France. And so it's going to be nuclear anyway. It's just that your nuclear power station is going to be uh, across the channel rather than on this side of the channel. So that's, that's quite, a, quite a sobering thought, that we're only producing 22% of our electricity with, with nuclear, and that may decrease rapidly in the near future. So how are we producing the energy from, from, uh, from nuclear energy? Well, we're using the fission process. And the fission process usually relies on uranium-238. A neutron comes in, splits the atom into two, uh, the nucleus into two components, releasing more neutrons, which then go on and split more, more nuclei. And with each split of the nuclei, we're generating the energy, and that's where the heat comes from inside a nuclear reactor. And that process goes on. Um, we're relying on one neutron from each split to go and split another atom. That's called criticality, and that's a chain reaction. If we have more than one neutron going on to split, we have a bomb. And this is what a lot of people are worried about, the relationship between the fission process in a reactor and the fission process in a nuclear bomb. So, oops. I've just tripped my reactor. Here's a... Uh, Apologise for this, I need my glasses to... Uh, here's a conventional nuclear reactor, so we have the core here. We have control rods, which contain the... Uh, which, which control the number of neutrons, uh, and we all have a cooling system as well. So if I bring the control rods out, you'll see the core temperature will go up, but I'll have to increase the pumps. Now, this is essentially how a nuclear reactor works. What you're doing is you're balancing the number of neutrons that you're producing against the cooling power of the system. If the system gets too hot, the reactor shuts down. If you produce too many neutrons, the reactor shuts down or blows up one of the two. So operating a nuclear reaction... A chain of operating a reactor based on a chain reaction is actually quite a complex process. It's very safe. Uh, I think we've had about 14,000 years of nuclear energy equivalent uh, on the planet, and um, the, the accidents so far have been relatively minor. But nonetheless, you're relying on the criticality of the reactor, and you're relying on the control system. If I can just stop that and move on. So what... What are we using for fuel? Well, we're using principally <coughs> uranium. And um, we use 
Oops, sorry. Natural uranium is 99% uranium-238 and about 1% uranium-235. Uranium-235 is the fissile component. So to make the system work, what we've got to do is enrich the uranium. We've got to process it, separate out the isotopes, until you've got about 3% uranium-235, 97% uh, uranium-238. And the way that the reaction process ta uh, takes place, a neutron comes along, it uh, forms a compound nucleus, uranium-236, which then splits into two components, and they decay down, producing radioactive products down the line here. That particular process produces about two and a half neutrons, some of which then go on to split further atoms. That's the chain reaction process, and that's the uranium cycle. So all the nuclear power stations that we have at the moment are based on uranium. Now, this means that if we want to maintain the current rate of electricity production using uranium, or alternatively, we want to increase the amount of electricity we're producing using uranium, um, what we're doing is also using a limited resource. And here is historically how much uranium we've used. 1.4 million metric tons. That's up to the present. And I've shown on this graph three potential scenarios. One is no nuclear build. In other words, nobody likes nuclear. We shut down the nuclear power stations and leave it. So in terms of the existing nuclear power stations running through to the end of their life, we will use about another 1.6 metric tons, a uh, million metric tons. If we say we want to maintain our current nuclear capacity, this implies a major increase in plant construction. This is to take into account this one gigawatt per day. We find that we'll use another 1.6 plus 3.1, which is 4.7 million metric tons, and that will keep us going till about 2080. If, on the other hand, we take the required scenario, given that nuclear is clean and we want to produce more electricity, what we've got to do is increase nuclear power generation globally to about 1,500 gigawatts by 2050. But there is a problem, and that is that we're going to use, in addition to this amount of uranium, another 10 million metric tons. And that is roughly the amount of uranium we think we have got left on the planet. Okay? So you won't build any more. The average lifetime of a power station is about 40 years. So come 2050, you probably won't build any more nuclear power stations based on the uranium cycle because there won't be enough uranium left to feed them. So what's the alternative? Well, the alternative that the UK nuclear industry is considering, Arriva in France and, and, and globally, is to say, well, we can actually breed our own fuel. We can build breeder reactors. We can produce fuel. And the reason we can do that is that, remember, that 97% of the enriched uranium is still uranium-238. So here, some of these neutrons that we're producing in this fission process will then go on to be captured by uranium-238, which will then go to uranium-239, neptunium, and then down to plutonium-239. And of course, plutonium is a fissile element and it can be used as a fuel. It's also the most toxic, toxic element on the planet and um, it is also pretty good for making bombs. And in fact, the reason that we're probably so entrenched in the uranium cycle is because in about the 1970s, the American military insisted that this process was used so we could produce more plutonium not to breed for fuel, but to, uh, to make bombs out of. And that's one of the reasons that we're so locked in to the, uh, the uranium fuel cycle. So if we agree that we need nuclear and we've got some uranium left, that's OK. The uranium's not going to last forever. We're going to have to move over to plutonium and breed plutonium. And plutonium will become the fuel. And there have been many documents written about the safety of nuclear and the reliability of nuclear and so on, and it's safe and it is reliable. But the, um, the MIT produced in, in, in 2003 a report on the future of nuclear power, and they updated this in, I think, 2009, I think. And although this document gives a very strong case for developing nuclear energy on a much wider scale across the planet, what it does point out is this. The nuclear option should be retained precisely because it's an important carbon-free source of power. And you can hear the but 
coming in that. But there are four unresolved problems. High relative costs, perceived adverse safety, environmental and health effects, potential security risks stemming from proliferation, i.e. of plutonium, and unresolved challenges in the long-term management of nuclear waste. And I think all of you know the waste problems, you know about the proliferation problems and the relation to terrorism. Uh, we know about radiation um, and, and the effects there. The high relative costs are debatable because it actually depends on how you do it. So that's the background in which we're looking at developing nuclear. So what I started to do as a project was look at ways possibly of delivering nuclear energy without those additional risks and without the risk of us running out of fuel in the next few years and without having to breed plutonium, of course. And to do that, if we look at the annual global use of energy resources, we find that we've got 5 billion tonnes of coal being used globally, 27 billion barrels of oil, 2.5 or 2,500 billion metres cubed of natural gas and 65,000 tonnes of uranium, and that's in one year. I found it was quite remarkable that if you look through the periodic table, you find that the same energy density is in 5,000 tonnes of thorium. Nobody's using thorium at the moment. The American government have just buried 30,000 tonnes of it because they don't know what to do with it. But all of this energy usage here can be extracted from five kilotons of thorium. And that, to me, seemed to suggest this is a planet saver. <coughs> if you look at thorium resources around the, 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 the globe, most of it is in benign, well, I assume that they're benign countries, yeah, um, Australia, United States, Turkey, India, Venezuela, Brazil, and Norway. Um, there are actually seams of thorium in Wales. But nobody's ever looked because they're not terribly worried about using it for anything. Um, so well, there is a lot of thorium on the planet, and th th this, these are the total reserves at the moment. Interestingly enough, that's equivalent to 10,000 years of nuclear fuel. The Norwegians have picked up on this, and they produced a report uh, early in, in, in 2008 using thorium as an energy source. And Norway, a very smart country, have realized that uh, oil is going to run out, gas is going to run out. So what natural resources have they got upon which they can build their economy and uh, hedge their bets against a, um, a future without gas and oil? And they picked on thorium as the, way, as the way forward. I wouldn't go out and invest in stocks in thorium at the moment, but I would certainly keep an eye on, on it. So how do you use thorium? The problem is that thorium is, um, is fertile, but it's not fissile. So you can't use it like you use uranium-235. What happens is that 100% of thorium is fertile. So remember that you've only got 99% of uranium, natural uranium, uh, which is, is, is not usable, but you've got 0.7% uh, you know, or thereabout that is, that is fissile. But 100% of thorium comes as thorium-232. The thorium nucleus captures, captures a neutron, goes to thorium-233, it then decays within about 22 minutes to protactinium-233, which then decays in 27 days to uranium-233. And that uranium-233 nucleus is the most fissile of all elements in the periodic table. So in principle, you can breed as much fuel as you need simply by putting neutrons into thorium. And it's actually the uranium-233 that then becomes the fissile component and upon which you base your reactor. So the advantages of thorium is that it doesn't need processing. You can dig it out of the ground and stick it in your reactor. It generates virtually no plutonium and far fewer higher actinides. And uranium-233 has superior fissile properties uh, compared to any other nucleus in the, in the periodic table. There are disadvantages. The first disadvantage is this neutron here. Where are you going to get that neutron from? And the way that thorium has been deployed to the present is you put in a fissile seed, i.e. you've mixed thorium with uranium-235 or plutonium. And the thing that worries me about that is that you've got a fuel which is extremely clean. So what you do is you mix something dirty with it, like uranium-235 or plutonium. 
is there another way of doing that? The other disadvantage, which is actually a great advantage, is parasitic uranium-232 results in a very, very high gamma activity. And this actually limits the possibility of the stuff being used uh, in, in, in terrorist activities. It's very, very hard to deal with uh, unless you've got proper facilities. So th using thorium is not that difficult. And there has been some past experience. Mm -hmm. If you look at the history of nuclear energy, you can find that when nuclear energy was first uh, developed, it could have gone down the thorium path or it could have gone down the uranium path. And it went down the uranium path for one reason and one reason only. It was good for making bombs. So, for example, if you look at the historical perspective, Oak Ridge National Laboratory ran thorium reactors. Uh, in Germany, uh, there was a high temperature gas reactor, 300 megawatts, a reasonable sized power station, which ran for a number of years with pure thorium fuel. Um, in the, in the, uh, the USA, again, there was a, um, a Port Fort St. Vrain reactor, one of the first commercial reactors in the US, uh, actually ran for a number of years on, on thorium until the US military told them to stop. And perhaps the most famous one is the, uh, the shipping port reactor in, uh, in the US, which was a light water breeder reactor. And it operated for five, uh, for five years 29,000 full, full uh, power hours. There is a report which tells you there was very little difficulty in the, in the operation of that reactor, and it actually bred more fuel than it used in that period. So it's a proven technology. You'd notice on the, on the table that I showed that there is actually quite a lot of thorium in India, and the Indians are now starting to exploit this. They've got a three-stage process. What they want to do is, first of all, breed plutonium. So you have a, a plutonium-fueled fast breeder into which you introduce thorium. The thorium produces the uranium-233, which, remember, is the fissile component, and then they will use uranium-233 mixed with thorium as a, a, a breeder and power source. It's quite a nice process. I suspect that the plutonium is quite important to India, as they probably want to make bombs as well. But on the other hand, they are drawing on their natural resources and they're removing the dependence on supply of uranium by sticking with thorium. But again, you're taking a clean fuel, you're mixing it with dirty components in order to use it. Another way of looking at it is an idea that was developed at Oak Ridge back in the 70s and then stopped by, again, the American military. And that's a liquid fluoride thorium reactor. So this is another way of running it. So you actually... This, the thought of this absolutely horrifies me, but a lot of people believe it may be the way forward. You mix uh, a, th a thorium fluoride, you melt the thorium, so it's a molten, uh, molten reactor, you pop in some uranium-233 and maybe some plutonium, and you let the thing... And surprisingly, this is actually a stable system. It's self-controlling. If anything goes wrong, you pull the plug on the bottom, all the liquid runs out, and you, you've got a, safe, a fail-safe system. The advantages of the liquid fluoride thorium reactor can be demonstrated in this. This is the uranium cycle, like water cy cycle here. 250 tonnes of uranium containing 1.75 tonnes of uranium-235, uh, 235, so you've got to purify that. Uh, you take out 35 tonnes of enriched uranium, you burn it in the reactor and you produce some, some plutonium. But at the end of the day, you have 35 tonnes of spent fuel 33.4 uh, tons of uranium-238, 0.3 tons of uranium and so on, and 0.3 tons of plutonium. So you're producing an awful lot of waste. <coughs> if you use one ton of thorium, you can produce the same amount of energy. Put it through the fluoride reactor, you end up with one ton of fission products, and in 10 years, 83% of the fission products are stable, and 17% of the fission products stop for approximately 300 years, compared to about 10,000 for plutonium. So that in itself is actually a very clean system. So if you can make the reactor work, and test reactors have been built, then that may be one way forward. In terms of, of waste, this is the um, residual radioactivity left when you've burnt uh, uranium-plutonium in, in a reactor. This is the equivalent of thorium. So that's the background level that you get from the plutonium, uh, uranium waste, 
this is the background level that you would get from the thorium mixed with uranium fuel cycle. This is a logarithmic scale. So we're actually going from a thousand here to a million. So there's a th roughly a thousandth of the radioactive waste from the thorium cycle as compared to the uranium cycle. So I convinced everybody that thorium is the way forward as a nuclear fuel. A lot of doubt, I think. Okay, so I, I won't go through that. Um, let me just take you back to this diagram because as part of a bigger project, it occurred to us that there may be another way of utilizing thorium that doesn't involve mixing it with all of the nasty plutoniums and uraniums and actinides and so on. And the key is in this neutron here. Are there other ways that we can produce those neutrons? Well, the answer is yes. We can use spallation. And spallation is something that this country is particularly good at. Uh, between 1980 and 1985, leaving the day that Margaret Thatcher owned it, um, I was responsible for helping build the ISIS spallation neutron source in Oxfordshire. And this is the most, uh, until recently, has been the most powerful spallation neutron source in the world. And I'll tell you in a moment what spallation is. Um, the US have just completed the SNS at Brookhaven, which is now the most powerful source in the world. And I'm on the advisory committee of J-Park in Japan, which is comparable to SNS, and that is nearing completion now. In fact, they've produced their first, first neutrons. So there is another way, a non-nuclear way, of providing the neutrons to, uh, to convert the thorium into a useful fuel. The, um, Europe is moving down the same, same direction. If you want to know more about uh, uh, spallation, uh, my friend Patrick and I made a movie on um, the European Spallation Source, which is a big project that I'm working on at the moment with the uh, ESS team in, in, in Lund. And you can find this on the internet, or if you want a copy, let, let me know. Um, so what is spallation? Well, it's, it's a relatively simple process, and it's based on, again, a technology that we know very well, and that's accelerator technology. So what we do is we take a very high power beam of protons and we bang them into heavy nuclei. And in banging the protons into the heavy nuclei, we spall or chip neutrons off. To spall is an Anglo-Saxon word, one of the few Anglo-Saxon words that isn't rude. Um, it's often used as a mining term. When you hit a rock with a hammer, you spall fragments off. So if we were able to get a high power accelerator, like that at ISIS or the SNS, we could use the protons that we're producing, we could bang them into a heavy metal target, like mercury or lead, and produce the neutrons. And those neutrons could then go on to uh, um, convert the thorium. And in fact, if you look at the neutrons that you produce with the spallation process, they all have energies of about one million electron volts. And that's exactly the right sort of energy for running the nuclear reactor. So the energy spectrum of protons induced by spallation neutrons are shown here. But the target in this case is a lead cylinder of about 20 centimetres diameter. And if you look at the energy, if you look at about one, uh, one MeV, we find that if we have one GeV protons, which is about the same as ISIS at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory and the SNS in Brookhaven, we produce 24 neutrons for every proton that we put in. So it's a highly efficient process. So this then gives us the opportunity of building a nuclear reactor, which in principle is infinitely safer than any nuclear reactor that we've got on the planet at the moment. And the reason for that is that, as I've pointed out, existing reactors are based on criticality. The reactor has to be critical in order to work. So in other words, every time a nucleus is split, we have to produce at least one neutron, which then goes on to produce more neutrons, releasing energy in the process. But we could also build a subcritical reactor, and people don't do this because a subcritical reactor is next to useless if you're using uranium. So here what we do is we have fewer than one neutron per split nucleus going on. So because there are insufficient neutrons to generate the chain reaction, what happens is that the reaction dies away naturally. So if you had a subcritical reactor based on uranium and conventional designs, it wouldn't work. Every time you try to, to, to fire it up, it would simply shut itself down. But if you've got an additional source of neutrons, for example, those that are produced by the accelerator, you can then actually go on 
to produce the neutrons to make the reactor effectively critical. But as soon as you shut off your accelerator, you have a fail-safe system that shuts itself down. So our design for an accelerator-driven subcritical reactor is something like this. We have an accelerator back here injecting protons down into the core of the nuclear reactor. This is the core here. The protons are coming in this way. They impinge on a spallation source, probably liquid lead. The neutrons are produced and they go into the reactor core. And that's where the thorium catch captures the neutrons. They convert it to uranium-233 and your reaction runs. But as soon as you switch off the protons, the system dies. So here's a little animation from a movie we did with Robert Winston. Here is the target, the spallation target in the middle with a core around it. The neutron beam, the proton beam comes in, produces the neutrons, but as soon as the proton beam switches off, as soon as the proton beam switches off, the reactor switches off. So you can act, you've actually got a nuclear reactor which is a bit like a light bulb. You can switch it on and off at will. All you do is you pull the plug on the accelerator. Now, what sort of accelerator would you need? Well, this is a neutron yield from protons impacting on target. And you can see that if we look at this as the number of protons divided by the energy of the protons, you reach a maximum at about 1 GeV. And as I say, this is the same sort of energy as the proton beam in the spallation process at SNS and ISIS. And in fact, there are problems because the radiation damage in the, in the target window scales roughly with the number of protons, not with beam power. So you don't want to produce too many protons. You need to go to higher energies. But alternatively, the accelerator-driven subcritical reactor um, has an energy gain which is proportional to this factor here. So it suggests that energies of 1 GeV are probably optimal. You don't want to go very much higher than that for efficiency. And here's the only equation that you'll find in my, my talk. You can calculate the thermal power output of an accelerator-driven subcritical reactor in terms of the number of spallation neutrons per second, and that's determined entirely by your proton beam. The energy release per fission, this is about 200 MeV. This is where you get the energy from for driving the reactor. Uh, v is the mean number of neutrons released per fission, and that's about two. And Kf is the uh, criticality factor. For a conventional reactor, that's one. For a subcritical reactor, obviously, it's going to be less than one. So we put in some numbers. Supposing we want 1,550 megawatts of thermal energy. This is equivalent to a power station of about 600 megawatts, an average size power station. You put the numbers in with this K effective here, and you find that a 1 GeV proton beam produces 24 neutrons if you've got a lead spallation target. And you can calculate the current that you need through your accelerator in order to, to uh, generate that sort of power. And it ends up as a very, very simple formula here. 640 uh, multiplied by 1 minus Kf over Kf, with well, the criticality factor, milliamps. So if we plot a graph of the proton beam current against effective criticality, we find that the lower we go in criticality, the more proton beams we need, because we're going to produce more neutrons. And the closer we get to criticality, the lower beam power we need. So if we went to 95% criticality, which is actually a long way below criticality, you find that you need 33.7 milliamps. That is 33.7 milliamps at 1 GeV is approximately, I guess, about 10 times more powerful than any accelerator currently existing on the planet. So you wouldn't do that. <coughs> if, on the other hand, you go to 0.9, nine in terms of, of, of criticality, you only need six milliamps. And that can easily be done, but you're getting very close to criticality. So if we assume that we're going to constrain the accelerator to 10 megawatts, and that's the sort of accelerator that people are building at the moment, for example, uh, the European Spallation Source, then what we need is a criticality factor of 0.985. And most of our designs have been based on that. How does that compare in safety? Well, it's actually very good. These are all conventional reactors. We've got an enormous safety margin compared to conventional reactors. But remember, compared to conventional reactors, we're not producing anything like the amount of waste, probably about a thousandth of the waste. And 
we're not producing any plutonium that can be used for bombs, and we can switch this off like a light bulb. So here's, here's my detailed design of an accelerator-driven subcritical reactor. Uh, we have an accelerator, high current, high energy accelerator. We extract the proton beam. We put that into a spallation target buried inside the reactor, producing the neutrons, and that drives the reactor process. We take the heat from that. We convert it with an efficiency of about 40% into electricity. We take some of that electricity back to drive the accelerator, and the rest we take out from the, uh, for the grid. And in fact, what we find is a 10 megawatt accelerator will generate 1,550 megawatts of thermal power, which will generate 20 megawatts to drive this 10 megawatt accelerator, and it will end up putting 600 megawatts back into the grid. This may all seem rather far-fetched, but we did a design based on this, and then we got talking to a half-owned Norwegian company called Arca, Arca Solutions, who are a part of Arca Caverna, uh, and they very slowly began to admit that they'd actually been working on the same principle. And the design they came up was almost exactly the same as ours. The sad story is that we were working together to try and build, and I'll go on to this later, to convince the government to give us the money to build a prototype. Um, the per present government weren't interested, so ARCA are probably going to take this technology now to China. We will probably build a Chinese copy later. So how does it work? Well, this is the different part. As I say, the proton beam comes into the target, the exploration target, and here's the reactor. So this is the bit that's different to a, a normal nuclear reactor, but the rest of it is exactly the same. Now, the idea is not a terribly new idea, and one person who's come up with a lot of ideas is Carlo Rubio. He got the Nobel Prize, um, I think in about 1985 or so. Uh, he was also the Director General of, of CERN. And Carlo Rubio developed the ADSR, the Accelerator Driven Subcritical Reactor Principle, uh, but he called it an energy amplifier. And if you think it is an energy amplifier, because you're putting in 10 megawatts and you're getting out 600 megawatts, so you've got an amplification there of 60. And if you go closer to criticality, you can get actually amplification factors of maybe as much as 200. Um, so why has no ADSR ever been built if this idea has been floating around since the, uh, the 1980s? Well, Carlo came over to Huddersfield and to a Thoria workshop, and we, uh, we discussed it. And the key is in the accelerator. What sort of accelerators do we have available? Well, we have cyclotrons. Cyclotrons are great. They have high currents of the order of an amp, but they only operate at low energy, and they also produce a continuous beam. The biggest cyclotron on the planet at the moment is at uh, PSI in Switzerland. Uh, it runs at 650 MeV and between 1 and 3 milliamps. But unfortunately, the energy isn't enough. We need to double that energy. You could use a synchrotron. Synchrotrons are great. ISIS runs on the synchrotron. The Large Hadron Collider is a synchrotron. But you can only produce very low currents, less than a milliamp, at very high energies. So that's not too suitable. The one that probably is the most suitable is the linear accelerator. High current, high energy. You can run it in the pulsed or continuous beam mode. But the problem is it's very large and very expensive. Uh, and who wants a nuclear reactor with a one and a half kilometer accelerator pointing at it? It doesn't seem to be a particularly sensible way forward. So what accelerator would you choose to drive one of these is actually not a trivial question. The other problem, and this is the real reason why no ADSR has ever been built, is because accelerators are notoriously unreliable. This is the beam profile over a few hours at PSI, which is one of the most reliable accelerators on the planet. And each one of these downward spikes is the accelerator switching itself off or being switched off for a problem. If you wanted to couple this to an ADSR, just think, every time this beam goes off, you're dumping 1,550 megawatts of thermal energy into the accelerator, into the, uh, the reactor core. And that's a real constraint for the engineering of an ADSR core. And in fact, when you look at the, uh, the figures, you realize that you've got to restrict. The, the, there must be probably 50 here in 50 hours. What you would need would be two trips a year to really get the system to work. 
So the real story is no existing accelerators work. So me and my friends in the British Accelerator Science and Radiation Oncology Consortium set up a project called Conform. We got eight and a half million pounds from RC UK to build a prototype of a new type of accelerator. And it's got a wonderful name that trips off the tongue. It's a fixed field alternating gradient accelerator, or FAG. Um, the cyclotron has a continuous but spiraling orbit. The synchrotron has a fixed orbit. The FFAG has got a varying closed orbit. But the thing that makes it simple and therefore very reliable is that it has a fixed magnetic field. One of the main problems with accelerators is changing the magnetic field on the time scale of the particles going round here. So we use strong focusing and, and the, f the first concept of the FFAG was developed in uh, the Midwestern states in about the 1950s. They couldn't build one then because they didn't have the computational power to develop the very, very uh, complicated field profiles that are needed in these, these accelerators and they didn't have the materials with which to build it. But Yoshimori in Japan uh, in the early 2000s built the first so-called scaling FFAG. The magnets are very big, it's very complicated. So what we did was decided to do something simpler uh, and we started building the world's first non-scaling FFAG. Non-scaling because the field profile within here is very much simpler. So this is the Japanese approach and this is the conform project approach. We're building the accelerator at Darsbury. It's a prototype. It's just been completed and we've injected the beam for the first time. We're based in the tower at Darsbury here. And this is <coughs> Emma, the electron model for many applications. Um, I've, one thing I've found in crossing to the dark side of working with particle physicists and accelerator scientists is that they will not do a project if they can't find an appropriate acronym for the uh, machine they're working with. We were actually working on another accelerator called PAMELA, and please don't ask me what that stands for. Um, Emma is a dinky little accelerator. It's a fraction of the size of this room. But what we're doing is not developing the accelerator to actually drive anything. What we're doing is looking at this non-scaling principle, because if the non-scaling principle works, we know that we can build bigger machines, and those bigger machines can be used to drive an accelerator-driven subcritical reactor. So we've been awarded said this, that's actually been increased to 8.5 now to develop and build the non-scaling accelerator. It's an exciting project, and here's a, a little animation when I found my mouse. So this is, the, this is the Emma ring here, the injection and the extraction. It's very much smaller, very much neater than almost any accelerator that anybody's ever built. And we're beginning to find now that the principle works, so we should be able to move along to the next stages. The advantages of a small accelerator is a small accelerator is cheap, because the cost of an accelerator is effectively dependent on the linear foot. So this gives us a, a real advantage, because if we can produce an FFAG to drive one of these, it will come in at about the third the cost of an, an existing accelerator. So why build one? Why not build three? And if we build three, we can mitigate against proton beam trips and fluctuations because we'll always have two accelerators firing into the, into the core. And in fact, my colleagues and I have just taken out a, a patent saying how you would control multiple accelerators into a single core. But the other thing is it also homogenizes the power distribution across an ADSR core. So instead of having a single target in the middle, you have three targets. You pump the protons into those three targets and you get a nice uniform power density within the core that looks much more like a conventional reactor. Emma's been attracting quite a lot of uh, information. If you want to read more about it, there was a, an editorial in Science on the project. This is, this is Emma here. This is a Japanese model. Um, in January 2010, uh, we've been covered in um, Physics World, Back to the Future, because we're redeveloping the old technologies. Uh, again, in Physics World, we looked at the, um, the thorium problem. We're, we're heavily cited in that. And my claim to fame at the moment is that in the first edition of Eureka, um, you'll see thorium there in the little thing. We were cited as one of 15 new ideas to change the future. 
at the moment, the Daily Mail are going, to re going up in scale from science, you know, through the physics world, through the Times. Read all about it in the Sunday Mail colour supplement in a couple of weeks' time. So, what are we doing at the moment? Well, we're developing the technique. We're using computer simulations of spallation neutron production, core composition and geometry for optimised ADS ADSR operation. And this is going on at Huddersfield, Manchester and Cambridge. We're commissioning EMMA at this very moment in Darsbury um, and we're developing the um, non-scaling FFAG design. And this is going on as part of the Conform project, of which we're a member, and uh, Darsbury Laboratory, CCLRC. We're doing molecular modelling of thoria and thorium under extreme radiation fields to find out how this thorium would stand up to a spallation environment. We're exploring um, spallation-induced furficon, fertile to fissile conversion in thorium for producing uh, thorium fuel rods. Here, everywhere it says Manchester, um, that's going to be short-lived because Roger Barlow, who is the head of particle physics and accelerator science at Manchester University, has just defected to the dark side across the uh, Pennines and is joining us in Huddersfield in uh, a couple of weeks' time. Um, and I've been working with the, um, the, the, the French, particularly the ILL and the CEA in France, to get accurate measurements of the uranium-233 fission yields so we can better model the reactors. We've got support from the IAEA. They gave us this, this wonderful statement here. Uh, IEA warmly welcomes the proposed accelerator driver development program and what in Thoria project as a positive contribution to the international efforts to secure the eventual global deployment of sustainable thorium fueled ADSR power generation systems. In 2009, Lord Drayson visited Darsbury and got quite enervated by the project and he asked for an optioneering report to find out what would be needed to deliver the technology to build the world's first ADSR power station. I was charged with writing that report, and there are copies here, if anybody wants to take one, it picks riveting reading, um, and also on the Conform project about the, and the other uses that we're going to put the accelerators to. Um, there are not many copies, but if anybody wants one. So I delivered that report in October 2009. Of course, we all know the government sit on reports for quite a long time, um, and we all know what happened earlier this year. That's the report we delivered. And then we had a conservative liberal co coalition who have shown particular disinterest in the project. I sent the report to five ministers and I got a report back, I got a, an answer back from one of them, which I think contravenes most of ministerial regulations that they're supposed to reply to you within, within 30 days. So at the moment it's not going very far, except we have Siemens and Arca on, on board and uh, just within the last day or two, um, the University of Texas A and M have said they want to collaborate with us on building a joint or developing a joint American-British uh, proposal. So our strategy was this. This is what we presented to the Labour government, and they seem quite happy with it. A five-year accelerator um, and core R&D program, which would be publicly financed at about 300 million, moving on to a three-year thorium-fueled ADSR design phase, a seven-year construction phase, which is average for a reactor, and then the world's first 600 megawatt thorium-fueled ADSR could be operational by 2025. That would be publicly financed, and that would be a public-private partnership, and then moving into private funding. For, and ARCA would actually be willing to invest in that. But what they want is to ensure they've got a good accelerator to start with. So that was our strategy. So... That's where we are at the moment, and, uh, and just to wind up, just a summary of, of what I've tried to get across. A thorium-fueled ADSR system would, if we were able to build one, provide, I can't think of any more adjectives to stick in there, so uh, an alternative, sustainable, safe, low-waste, proliferation-resistant technology for nuclear power generation. Remember, if you only walk away with one thing, just remember that 780 kilograms of thorium is equal to 200 tonnes of uranium as nucle nuclear fuel. No plutonium is used and very little is produced. And after 70 years, the radiotoxicity radio is 20,000 times less than an equivalent conventional nuclear power station. It's also a means of burning existing legacy waste 
Because if you take all of the garbage that current reactors churn out, so for example, they're churning out uh, higher actinides, they're churning out plutonium, you can mix those fuels in with the thorium and you can burn them. And ironically, the UK is not willing to invest in this technology, but Brussels, um, the, Bel the Belgians, are in fact going to invest in a project called Myra. It was announced earlier this year. They're putting in 600 million and they're expecting another 400 million from collaborat collaborating states to build an ADSR, not to produce power, but to burn waste. Waste can be mixed with thorium and burned as fuel, reducing radiotoxicity radio by orders of magnitude. Um, and it's also a technology that allows rapid load following. So when everybody switches the World Cup on, you can very easily generate more power overnight. You can reduce the current and produce less electricity. Current nuclear doesn't track the load very well indeed. And that's roughly, I think, where we are. So to finish off, those are my collaborators, um, including CCLRC's Accelerator Science and Technology Division, the members of the British Accelerator Science and Radio Con Oncology Consortium, and the members of the Conform Project, and of course Thoria, that I would recommend that you join. Um, thank you.